a TGIF on this good Friday, everyone. Welcome into the First Call podcast for First Bet and Express Bet. He's Jeff Siegel and I'm Jeremy Plunk. We've got a big weekend. On the Triple Crown Trail, this might be the biggest week of all because we really had three big races last weekend to review. We've got three big ones again this week going on. Santa Anita Derby still just a little bit off in the future, Jeff, on the horizon in a week's time with the bluegrass. But, man, we're going to learn a lot about this Triple Crown class coming up this weekend with the Florida Derby, the UAE Derby overseas, and then, of course, uh, the Arkansas Derby. This is one of the biggest weekends of the spring. It really is pivotal. Um, and again, some of these uh, horses that we like, everybody seems to like, uh, in terms of their Triple Crown potential, get one more chance to verify um, their reputation or chip away at it. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, we're still trying to figure out what we have with fierceness, um, I think the Arkansas Derby will tell us uh, something where even though Muth can't run in the Derby, he certainly can give us a, a measuring stick as yes. to what Arkansas has. Mm-hmm. And then maybe we'll find out a little bit about Dubai and, and what, mm-hmm. what what we can expect um, from the Japanese cold. I mean, I, I don't know how good Forever Young is. I, I do know that he impressed me very much when he was able to beat a Colt that I really like Bookham Dano, a, a horse that we know out here in the States. And for him to run him down at a distance that's probably too short for him gives him a chance to maybe establish himself as a legitimate major player uh, mm-hmm. in Kentucky if he were to go out and win the UAE Derby. And uh, so we'll be watching that as well. Uh, so uh, outstanding racing uh, everywhere except Santa Anita, where we'll be underwater, I am told, uh, tomorrow with a deluge of rain coming. Uh, and we uh, will not be racing at Santa Anita Saturday or Sunday. But the Santa Anita Derby uh, next week um, will tell us something. I, I don't know if we'll even have a Derby starter, Kentucky Derby starter out of that race. But, mm-hmm. again, trying to figure out what we have out in California uh, for the two remaining legs of the Triple Crown, the Preakness, and the uh, the Belmont. It's such an important three-year-old week that we're two minutes, 20 seconds into the podcast. And we haven't mentioned the $12 million Dubai World Cup. That's obviously the biggest race in the world going on this weekend in terms of purse and the international interest amongst the handicap division. But we are very three-year-old centric here in the U.S. And handle-wise here in America, the Florida Derby is going to far out handle the Dubai World Cup. So it's not just our preference to talk about on the three-year-old trail, the uh The backers will back that opinion as well when we get to the mutual windows coming up on Saturday. But a huge day of racing all across the world starting early in the morning. First Bet and Express Bet will simulcast all the races from Dubai. They get underway at 7.30 a.m. Dubai World Cup, of course, the feature race there. And we've got a $10 money back special on all of the races from Dubai on Saturday. If your win bets in any of those races from Maidan run second or third, you'll get up to $10 back in the form of wagering credits in your account. So be sure to play the Dubai World Cup card with first bet and express bet for those of you watching on twitter and youtube hit the like the repost the share comment down in the comment section we'd love to hear from you about our show and help build the audience for us here on the first call podcast and for those of you on our traditional audio channels here's a look at the schedule of eight races jeff and i'll handicap here over the next so 30 minutes or so the races for saturday march 30th line up this way from made on on dubai world cup day we will handicap the uae derby and the dubai world cup those two races from overseas at oak lawn we will handicap the three-year-old phillies in the fantasy and the three-year-old colts in the arkansas derby And at the Gulfstream Park, we go for four stakes races on an absolutely loaded card Saturday. The Pan American Stakes, the Orchid, those two on the turf. Then we'll go to the Phillies in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, our express bet race of the week. And the Florida Derby will be our main event. That'll be our eighth and final race that we handicap. Tournament players, a lot going on this weekend. Today, on Friday, you can play in the $300 uh, contest. That is a feeder towards the Florida Derby Challenge or the Santa Anita Derby Challenge. Be sure to play in that one today. That aforementioned Florida Derby Challenge, a $1,500 handicapping contest, is Saturday. So try to play today in the feeder for $300. You might make your way into that $1,500 contest. All expenses paid. And then on Sunday, we've got a $40 feeder for some future handicapping contests at Gulfstream Park. Our Exactathon promotion has been very popular this spring. We're running it back. $25,000 Exactathon on Saturday at Gulfstream Park. That means if you can hit an Exacta in six or more races on the big 14 race card for Florida Derby Day, you'll share in $20,000 in bonus money. 
All the other players who hit six or more will share. Typically, two, three hundred dollars. The bonus we're looking at players who hit six or more exactas in the exactathon throughout the course of the spring, and then another five thousand dollars will be split amongst the players who have the most exactas on the card. So check it out: the twenty-five thousand dollar exactathon, Florida Derby Day. Uh, Saturday at Gulfstream Park. And Jeff, you're going to help the fans with that exactathon because I know you're putting a full card analysis together for the blog section, Express Bet and First Bet. Uh, no Santa Anita racing, but you're not taking the day off. No, I mean, I, I, I quite frankly, <laughs> I would rather do Gulfstream than Santa Anita. So that actually the rain did me a favor. It gives me an opportunity <laughs> to do a card I really want to do. That's 14 races. We'll have uh, race by race analysis there. I've done most of the work already. Um, it'll be up first thing. In, well, it'll be up actually later tonight, but you'll be able to access it first thing in the morning uh, with early Good. post time. Uh, you should have no trouble uh, getting the information there. And I'll actually update it if there's any late scratches. So really putting my uh, my uh, hopefully my good skills to work in Gulfstream because it's an outstanding 14 race card. There's a number of races that I really do like. Sometimes the card plays you rather than rather mm -hmm. vice versa. But this is one situation where I came up with a number of plays I like. So absolutely, it's, of course, it's always free for express bet uh, uh, players. Uh, you know, check it out tomorrow morning and uh, hopefully we'll make some money together. All right, let's get making money here on the podcast with our eight stakes races for the weekend. We're going to start out at Maidan for the UAE Derby. It's race number five on the program from Dubai. Group two race at a mile and three sixteenths, like the Louisiana Derby stateside. It's the co-longest prep towards the uh, Triple Crown races here in the states. The UAE Derby worth a million dollars and a hundred Kentucky Derby qualifying points. Many of these, I believe, eight or nine of them are Triple Crown nominees, including the favorite Forever Young, winner of the Saudi Derby. As they straighten, Bentonato the first one to commit. Behind these, Bookham Dano, the Americans go 1-2. Now Forever Young is forced to dig in because he's given them a three-length start at the top of the home run. It is Bentonato and Bookham Dano, Forever Young at this stage. He's flat. He's got three lengths still to find. 300 metres to do it as Bookham Dano moves through to lead for Irad Ortiz. Now Forever Young, but belatedly beginning to pick up. Bookham Dano needs the line now as Forever Young surges on the outside. Bookham Dano Forever Young is coming. Book of Dano all out. Forever Young dives and may have got it in the final bound. Forever Young and Bookham Dano could go either way here. It did indeed go to the favorite in that race, Forever Young. He'll be favored again heavily in the Whirlpool betting national sim international simulcasting on the UAE Derby. Now, Jeff, that race in Saudi Arabia was a one-turn mile. Now we go two turns and a mile and three-sixteenths. Completely different pace dynamic expected, completely different track configuration, two lead changes around two turns versus one. Uh, quite a bit different about this race. And I hope that we're going to get a different performance from Forever Young. I hope he's more emphatic this time. I think he will be. In fact, uh, he might have found a one-turn mile a little too sharp for him, and I give him right. credit for nailing a very good horse who had a clear lead inside the furlong pole. His three races in Japan, and I've seen a, at least one I know for sure um, recently uh, on video, uh, were around two turns, and they all were actually visually quite impressive. Now, I don't know who he's beating in those races. Mm -hmm. I don't know who he beat in the Saudi Derby, and that's good enough for me to expect that he'll beat this field. The only other horse that uh, I can really relate to here is Panda Gate, Christophe Clement's arrow three-year-old, who has won two out of three, uh, both wins coming against New York breads. Uh, third, a modest third in an allowance race at Laurel. I don't know whether he's, I mean, he's okay, but he's not, right. I don't think he's forever young. So, I mean, this basically is not only ex expecting forever young to win this race, but we want him to do it in such a manner that we will be able to respect him Give him a legitimate chance in Kentucky. If he's just blah and just goes out and wins by a, however, you know, he wins, but not, not impressively, then uh, we won't have to worry too much about him. But I think we will. I mean, he's undefeated in four starts. He's already proven he can run, run long. He had a good colt last time. Um, and um, he really could beat this field. I'm looking at the form, and I don't see anything that has his uh, resume. You like to say the goosebump meter. So on a one to ten, what are we looking for in here? If you're going to get excited about Forever Young for the Kentucky Derby, how many goosebumps out of ten does he have to give you? Uh, at least eight, and preferably nine. Oh. And 10, okay. You know? I mean, I I don't want to, you know, and you know how it is where 
<laughs> usually when you watch a race, your first impression is probably the correct one. You know mm -hmm. how you feel when you see a race, you'd say, mm, yeah, you want, but nah, you know. But right. then you go back and sometimes and you look at certain things and maybe notice things that maybe you didn't notice and you think, okay, this was actually a better race than I gave him credit for. I'll up him on the scale, a, a goose bump or two. But mm -hmm. um, no, you're right. I mean, he's going to have to blow me away to, to expect for him to come over because I have seen horses come over in the past that I expected to run well, and they haven't. So right. if they don't really impress me, then I'm really not going to be too keen on their chances. But again, I think this is a, a really, really good colt, a legitimate colt, and uh, I hope he shows it the uh, UAE Derby. We have to say it because it's a fact. I mean, every year is different, but no horse from the UAE Derby has ever finished in the top four in the Kentucky Derby. you got to go to Master of Foxhounds that ran – uh, fifth in the Kentucky Derby, the, or Master of Hounds, the, the only horse who's running the top five in the Derby, I believe 19 starters, 0 for 19, none of them in the money. So I would think that this will be a very legitimate Kentucky Derby contender if Forever Young hits that 8, 9, 10 on Jeff's good long scale this weekend. I'll let you know what we it is right now. I'll give you a, a good, uh, a good uh, scientific uh, count next Tuesday on uh on its official. How about that? that? That's what we need to hear. Now, we also have two in here for Aiden O'Brien, who frequents this race uh, with horses that are Triple Crown nominees on occasion to see will they handle the dirt, right? He's got a couple horses that have run on the turf and on synthetic. Navy Seal was terrible in the patent stake last time. It was just a three-horse field. Scratch down was supposed to basically be a walkover for him. He ran third of three. I don't know what he's going to do on a different surface now, third time out for or the uh, third last time in the patent again, but again in a three-horse field for Navy SEAL. It looks like the stronger of the Aiden O'Briens to me would be Henry Adams because Ryan Moore's taking them out there. That's usually yeah. your tell with the Aiden O'Brien stable. He's by no name ever, but out of a Galileo mare, so there's speed on top, brilliance or uh, brilliance on top, stamina on the bottom, a good pedigree for Henry Adams, a horse who was fourth in the Dewhurst last year, fourth in a group one at Longchamp. So he's in internationally has some claim about him but he's never run beyond seven furlongs now he's got to go a mile and three sixteenths around two turns to the dirt surface and, and make the long trip from ireland to dubai uh i don't know what we're going to get out of henry adams but he was only beaten six lengths by city of troy he's probably the best two-year-old in the world last year let's see what henry adams has in here he could be a horse for the kentucky derby if he runs well you're probably gonna have to run one two in this race to make the derby field 150 100 to the winner, 50 to second, 25 to third. Maybe third would get you in the field this year for the Kentucky Derby. That's going to be very close. But certainly you want to want to, want to run one, two out of this race uh, if you want to make the Kentucky Derby field. Let's turn the page now to the Dubai World Cup. It's race number eight, uh, or race number nine, I should say, on the nine race card. That eighth race, we're not going to handicap, but the Longines uh, Dubai Shima Classic, 10 Group 1 winners in there, two of them Breeders' Cup uh, turf winners, August Rodin and others. What a field that's going to be. But to the Dubai World Cup, we go in race number nine to get Jeff's handicapping thoughts on this one. A field of 12, you have the defending champion, Ushba Tesoro, amongst the runners. You've got the Rags the Richest, story in some respects of senior buscador from america newgate for bob baffert uh, a field that has a lot of names jeff that fans are familiar with from american racing derma sodagaki of course over here last year for a second in the breeders cup classic and a kentucky derby run some expatriated american horses like laurel river who used to be in southern california now in the middle east defunded in that same boat Clapton and Krupe coming from the U.S. to run overseas. So a real American influence in this year's Dubai World Cup. But this is not cigar. You know, this is not one of those Arrowgate Dubai World Cups. Uh, this is a balanced attack from America that lacks a standout star. That's correct. Uh, I tell you the truth, the turf race might be better than the dirt race this year. Right. You mentioned. Um, but uh, this is the, the big race, the grade one with $12 million. So I figured we probably should give it a little bit of a look anyway. Sure. Um, now, Ushba Tesoro, of course, won um, this race uh, last year, and he did it visually very impressive. I, I thought that was a, a really good race, so much so that I actually picked him in the Breeders' Cup Classic last year, and he didn't run badly. I, I kind of dismissed a handicapping factor that I probably shouldn't have because I really did want Ushba Tesoro to win at Santa Anita, but you don't come from 12 lengths back or 12, 10 lengths back at Santa Anita and win a race. He, and a good race. I mean, you can if, the, if you've got uh, the front runners collapsing. 
But this race, uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic, they had too many good horses that had to do that. So I thought under the circumstances, finishing fifth beat in just over three lengths was good. They put it, they turned him out, stopped on him uh, 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 after a, a win in Japan. And, um, you know, um, uh, I, they didn't really stop on him. I and mean, they, they, they spaced his races. But I thought he ran really well in the Saudi Cup. Now, in that race, he did he blew the break. Uh, he, he, mm -hmm. he, I don't know whether he broke bad or he got knocked back, but he was way back early. And instead of just sitting on him and making one run, the jock put him into a drive into the turn, which is a little early. He made this extended run, actually hit the front, and then got nailed right on the money by Senior Buscador, who was he was behind early, past midway, mm -hmm. and then got nailed. I mean, he really ran a winning race. It was just pilot yeah. error. Now, this time, going a mile and a quarter, hopefully he'll wait. There's a long run in from the top of the stretch to the wire. Mm -hmm sit there you don't have to make the move a half mile too soon and in this race there should be a legitimate pace there are horses in here who like to go to the front or at least close or, or at least close up Dermot Sotogaki remember his win in the UAE Derby uh, of what gate to wire he basically needs to be on or nigga lead because he doesn't have a, a kick he's a grinder so I think they'll send him hard to try to make the lead if he can uh there's a few <laughs> others Little River is not waiting around for anybody so um, I think Ushput Tesoro, if he gets the patient right he needs, he will repeat and be a two-time winner of the Dubai World Cup uh, race. Got, and, uh, I think he's going to win if he gets the right ride. He got that last year from Kawada. Let's go back to the Dubai World Cup 2023. Ushput Tesoro in victory. And they're into the stretch of the Dubai World Cup. Ben Dug out cheers. These two turn for home one, two. They're side by side with three sixteenths of a mile to run. And from the back of the pack, here comes Ushba Tesoro with a rush on the far outside. Algiers to catch. Ushba Tesoro gains in, goes by. Ushba Tesoro hits the front. Ushba Tesoro wins the Dubai World Cup. Now, Jeff, among the Americans in here, who do we like the best? Is it Senor Buscador's second road trip for him? He stayed on the road, of course, shipped to win the Saudi Derby and, or the Saudi Cup and then stayed overseas. Is he the best of the Americans? Do you expect Newgate maybe to be able to step forward off his win in the big cap at Santa Anita from Bob Baffert? Uh, who do you like amongst the horses with the U.S. interests? Good question. I, I I tried to like him, and I just I mean I have I mean Newgate won the big cap, but he didn't even earn a triple digit buyer number. It, it was a good race. I think he'll probably run his race. I don't know how mm -hmm. uh, how how his how good he really is. Um, defunded looks like he's uh, over the top. Senior Buscador. I went back and watched the specific World Cup. Uh, I mean I mean the Pegasus World Cup race, and he had everything go his way in a sense. The the pace the, the situation was blazingly. And he wasn't really blasting home. He might be more comfortable around one turn. I don't know. But um, he doesn't seem to have the same blast over mm -hmm. two turns. I think he'll run okay because he's a good horse. But there's no way I like him over Ushbo de Toro. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Krupi, I mean, he's a curlin, So I'm always going to give him a little bit of a look. I don't – I mean, he's not bad. I mean, you know, he could maybe clunk up and get a piece of it. <laughs> uh, but other than that, uh, and Laurel Rivers, I always liked Laurel River when Bob had him. I just don't see him as a mile and a quarter horse. Uh, but right. I, I'm glad he's in the race because he'll have a, pa a decent pace. But I think Ushba de Zorro, it's his race lose if he shows up with anything close to his best. For more on the Dubai races, be sure to check out the blog section, expressbet.com and at news.first.com. And on the social media channels, as we'll have Michelle Yu's analysis for not only the Dubai World Cup, but the undercard races. Remember, she was over in Saudi Arabia and covered many of these horses a month or so ago for the Saudi Cups. So we'll get Michelle's thoughts for the big races in Dubai coming up this weekend. And again, that $10 money back special on all the races on the card from Maidan on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon here in the States. Uh, $10 money back special means if you're win bet finishes second or third in any of the races you'll get up to ten dollars in wagering credits back into your account so check that out for dubai world cup day saturday morning here stateside to oakland we go on saturday it's the biggest day of the racing season in hot springs arkansas it's not closing day like it was for many a decade of course the extended schedule a few years ago at oakland park that now takes us through kentucky derby weekend uh means we don't have that big clump of stakes races on arkansas derby day but we do have four of them including the oakland mile uh we've got a 
sweepstakes called the Matron. And then we're going to handicap the fantasy traditional three-year-old Philly race towards the Kentucky Oaks. And of course, the featured Arkansas Derby. There'll be races 11 and 12 on the card Saturday from Hot Springs. Jeff, let's go to race number 11, the fantasy stakes. Uh, this is a race wet paint uh, was kind of going through that division last year in dominant fashion. We haven't seen that kind of standout Philly this year at Oak Lawn in the three-year-old Philly division. In fact, uh, when Lemon Squeeze won the, uh, or Lemon Muffin, I should say, when she won last time out in the Honey Bee, she was not only 28-1, to she was a maiden making her sixth start. So the big prep race into this on the local division was won by a six-race maiden. Are we looking for somebody from out of town? Are we looking for somebody to rebound? Are we looking for Lemon Muffin to come right back in this year's fantasy? I'm looking uh, at the Philly who is even money against seven um, mm -hmm. up in, um, in the Honey Bee, and that's West Omaha. She really had a brutal trip that day. I, I, it looked like she might have hit the side of the gate, leaving the gate at the start, N never got position, and raced in a box every step of the way. She had horses in front of her, horses to the left, horses to the right, mm -hmm. horses behind her. She was kind of stuck, and she got mad. I mean, she wanted to go. She was under a tight hold and kind of pulling. And she did this all the way around to the top of the stretch. And even when she got clear, I mean, she still wanted to go. She just was spent by then. Mm -hmm. But her order in the Silver Bowl today, two races back, it was the opposite. She had clear sailing outside, blew away her field. And that's the reason why she was such a short price in the honeybee. So with any kind of decent luck, um, West Omaha, I think, is going to turn the tables on not only Lemon Muffin, but everybody else who's in this race. I still think she's a really decent sort of filly for mm -hmm. Brad Cox, and I think she's going to show it here. One other horse I, I tried to like, I, I really gave her every chance for me to like her, is my main squeeze. Mm -hmm. Birkin Vader, daughter of Audible, who uh, has been beating up, obviously, on uh, on state-bred fillies. Um, but her numbers are strong. I went back and watched her last race, and she she went well. I mean, she did. she had a nice outside draw. She had a good trip and all that. I just didn't get the feeling that she was a two-turn filly. She's kind of a short striding mm -hmm. wife. Looks like a sprinter. Able to win that race uh, over a one-turn mile. But if you look at the race, it was pretty fast early and pretty slow late, even though it got a big number because of the deep track. But she did not really strike me as a filly who's mm -hmm. going to move around two turns. Now, you know how I do it, Jeremy. You know, first time around two turns, I'll, I'll always give them a second look, yeah. especially the rail. Um, so maybe she'll, um, she'll outrun what I expect her to do. And I think she'll run well, cause I think she's a good mm -hmm. not enough for me to like her. Not enough for me to think that she can beat West Omaha. She does get Flavian Pratt, which I thought was really interesting in here because Pratt will ride first call for Cox in almost all the big races these days, it seems like. West Omaha gets a jockey change. Uh, Christian Torres, the local leading rider, was part of that nightmare trip last time. And Cox goes to the bullpen, but he gets Tyler Gaffleone, which is kind of just, uh, you know, I mean, they, they team up a lot and they team up very successfully, about 40% from 53 starts, according to the uh, racing form statistics. Unbelievable jockey trainer combo. I would have just assume Cox would have went to Pratt in here, but Pratt ends up on my main squeeze. He obviously didn't choose my main squeeze over West Omaha. I don't think that was the case, but just interesting that Pratt is available here and Maker is able to get an A-list rider from that New York Red Philly sprint the route, like you said, uh, from the rail. Uh, could be an interesting one in here, but West Omaha upon her best. That was when she was in the Silver Bullet Day, two starts back. And if you look at that, every other pattern for some racehorses, she's on it. Lost the debut, oh, yeah. then won, lost the untappable. And then this race in the Silver Bullet Day, uh, if she runs back to this one, she's going to be definitely the Philly to beat. West Omaha is poised on the outside for Luis Saez and Sistina Chapel coming with a four-path run as they straighten for home. Accommodate Diva, West Omaha, Miss Code West is in between Phillies. Three quarters and one minute 13.70 seconds. West Omaha has taken the lead from Miss Code West with on the outside Sistina Chapel and perfect shot was angled out as Accommodate Diva has dropped back. It's West Omaha, West Omaha. Omaha here in a dominating display. She's raced away. West Omaha won by five. And as for Lemon Muffin, the filly who won last time out in the Honey Bee, like sometimes this is one of these classic, if this is a regular overnight kind of race, I'd call this the nibbler breaks out angle where horses who are just kind of close, 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 and then all of a sudden break their maiden by daylight. Oftentimes that's when the light bulb says something went on and this horse finally got it and they destroy a field and you feel great about it moving forward. 
But with Lemon Muffin, you did it at 28 to 1 last time. You're probably going to get 5 to 1 in this race, you know, probably second, third choice in the betting. I can't take that price from the 11 hole now, you know, stuck way outside here. I can't take 5 to 1 from the 11 hole and assume that this horse has woken up and it's time for her to move forward. If she's a big price, you know, she's 7, 8, 9, 10 to 1, then maybe you get into it. But I think you got to be price sensitive with Lemon Muffin. It's a lot to ask of her from the 11 hole to prove it again at a much shorter price than she did last time. From a gambling standpoint, I'd be against her. But from a fan standpoint, I wouldn't mind seeing D. Wayne Lucas back into Kentucky Oaks. We saw what he did uh, just a couple of years ago with Secret Oath out of this path at Oaklawn's. So uh, good luck to the coach. What, 88 years young, and he might have a derby and oak source this year. Uh, he's trying to get there. Well, he, she might be in the race even if she doesn't win the oaks. You know? <laughs> uh, but I think she'll run well. But she got the same kind of really soft trip that actually West Omaha got in the race that we just saw in the Silver Bullet Day. Mm -hmm. And the roles were reversed, and that's the difference in why she was able to beat West Omaha. I don't right. envision West Omaha having – it's no way she could have a worse trip than she got in the honeybee. And if she gets a good trip, I think the, you'll see a massive switch in the performance here. West Omaha, Jeff's top pick in the Philly race, the fantasy. To the three-year-old Colts we go, the Arkansas Derby, $1.5 million purse here, going a mile and an eighth on the main track. Post time, 747 Eastern, 647 local in Hot Springs for this grade one over nine furlongs in a field of 10. And Jeff, I think we can whittle this down to four. I think the three favorites in here really don't have holes in their game. You might have a question here and there, like Mystic Dan was that last race because of the sloppy track, but the quality is very apparent. Muth, the quality, highly apparent, and his resume, we know what he can do. And then the other one, uh, you know, amongst the uh, the favorites in here, Timberlake, his return race in the Rebel. I didn't think he was necessarily a two-turn horse at the end of his two-year-old season. I thought his Rebel was awfully good, a good final three furlongs. It shows to me he belongs in this race and belongs amongst the top of the class. So uh, those top three are really good. Liberal Arts, to me, the other one to keep an eye on. And also Time for Truth, actually. I maybe we go to five in here for the exotics because I think time for truth with Ron Moquet is a real up and comer going to make the uh, stakes route debut ran in a stakes sprint a couple starts back got the allowance of victory last time out going long so time for truth liberal arts those are the price horses on the unders but I think for uh, the main purpose of this race the three favorites in the morning line are three of the top 10 15 horses in anybody's consideration towards the Kentucky Derby right now and uh, it's go time for them. this is going to be a big one I was, I'm still trying to figure out Muth. Um, I've loved him. I've been off him. I've been back on him. Uh, and then I, I, so I said, I'm really going to take a critical look at his form and see if I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and we. And Muth, Muth on the. Uh, we'll get that in a sec. There yeah, we go. go ahead. That's out. what I was going for. Why, why yeah. you're talking about Muth, this is watch him yeah, trade. There have been times with Muth has looked flat in the morning and I figured, okay, he's one of these precocious two-year-olds who aren't isn't going to train on and then we have this work he's on the outside and working with winstock who is maybe not a derby horse but still a pretty decent useful three-year-old right and this is Muth looking like he's ready to run his best race he's on the outside he's under an ice hole um and he is um just i'm sure the the instructions are try to stay together let him finish up a little from the quarter pull home don't want anything really blazing Blazingly fast. We're going to put him on the plane, but I want to make sure that he's where he needs to be before I send him. So this was the work I think before Bob really had committed to going to Oakland and he mm -hmm. wanted to see exactly what he shows here. As you can see, moving from the outside, still going well within himself, not being asked, chirp to just a little bit to pick it up because he wanted, wants him to finish. He doesn't want to ride him hard or anything, but uh, you can see him kind of edge away from his workmate, who's actually being ridden a little bit to try to stay even. Now they get to the wire, and this is when Bob usually asks him to, to gallop out well, because sometimes these these horses will kind of ease up at the wire because that's what they're used to doing. But he's yeah. going to go off and, and win the work by many, many lengths and gallop out very well. And this tells me and told Bob Baffert, okay, I can put him on the plane and, and, and be optimistic that the Muth 
that we've seen run so many good races is going to show up. And if you mm -hmm. look at his form, he comes off a win in the San Vicente, which was visually very pleasing. His second place finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, even though he was 5-2, to two, and they thought he had a chance to win, uh, yeah. wasn't bad when you consider how well Fierceness uh, was and who mm -hmm. was behind him that day. It was a tough race. He won two turning in the American Pharaoh, um, so you know he can route. And mm -hmm. uh, he's got a series of solid works. I, I just think Muth is... There is not a reason in the world why he shouldn't be the best race. Uh, mm -hmm. He's good enough. His form is good. His numbers are strong. His workouts are great. The pace situation does not look terribly intense. He likes to no. sit off the pace. He's going to get an easy, soft trip. I mean, you know, you, you talk about the contenders, and a lot of the – running second and third in this race is very important to some of these goals who want to get yeah. in the derby. It's not that important to move because he's no, there's no derby <laughs> for him. But this is a race that Bob Baffert usually set, wins when he sends one. And I think he's going to going to win this one with Muth. Let's take a look at that San Vicente victory by Muth earlier this year. And Muth. Muth on the outside and Pilot Commander head and head turning for home. Two back to Slider in third. Three sixteenths of a mile to go. Muth and Pilot Commander. Friends in the morning. Foes in the afternoon, and Muth is let loose now. And here comes Muth through the stretch, outclassing them in the San Vicente. It will be Muth and Juan Hernandez to win it by three emphatic lengths. So Muth is the eight to five morning line favorite. Uh, Timber Lake second choice at nine to five. I think that's about right. I mean, you got Baffert and Cox. They're going to take a lot of money. I think Mystic Dan goes higher than five to two in here. A lot of respect for his last win on the numbers, no doubt. One hundred one buyer figure. That was on a muddy track and came up the inside with just a freakish kind of mind that bird finish uh, for mind that birds two thousand nine uh, Kentucky Derby that day. Just blew him away in the slop. Uh, does Mystic Dan run back to that? Uh, if he does, he's obviously good enough to win this, Jeff. He's got a little bit of a tough post out there from post nine. I don't know where he's going to be pace-wise because he's a horse who pressed the pace in, in some of his previous starts. He was a little farther back uh, uh, in, in that race last time because he had an outside draw, and Brian Hernandez did a good job of just kind of taking back and getting over saving ground. I would imagine it works so well they're going to try to employ the same strategy, right? Take back with him, try to sit five, six, seven lengths off what it's going to be a quicker pace here today uh, and try to save some ground and make a run. What do you make of Mystic Dan's chances? I don't know, but he is the one horse that I really will be watching because I don't know what to make of him. If he's as good as he was, if he's if he's as good as he showed in the Southwest over an off track, then he's definitely a major contender and maybe mm -hmm. even a likely winner. But I have been fooled over the years too many times by great performances in an off track Mm -hmm. And I will continue to be fooled. <laughs> I'm not. I haven't learned anything by now. I I never will. Um, uh, being you know sucked in by horses who look terrific on an off track, and then you put them back on the dirt, uh, the dry land, and they revert to their dry land, mm -hmm. dry track form, which does not make Mystic Dan look like a major contender. Mm -hmm. But you know he's a three year old. He's developing. Maybe that right. last muddy track race. Um, um, you know, maybe that's what he is right now. I hope to see it. I mean, we could use another major contender. Um, so the one the one thing that I'm I don't know about Timberlake. I he did what he had to do in the Rebel. He did not score very high on the goosebumps factor. <laughs> I mean, he right. was working like it was a good race. The number was okay, not great. I think Muth will be to Timberlake. But if Mystic Dan shows up with his rebel, I mean Southwest form, now we have a horse race. I will say quality of field wise, the Southwest was a tougher field than the Rebel. That the Rebel was yeah. not that strong this year. Uh, not a big heavyweight shipper to take on uh, Timberlake in that particular spot. And remember, the Southwest was delayed because of weather by a week. So that made it three weeks between that race and the Rebel Stakes. So a couple of the big players, including two that are back in the Arkansas Derby, skipped the Rebel Stakes because it was too tight of a window. So Mystic Dan didn't run back on the three weeks, uh, You know, nor did Liberal Arts for Robbie Medina. So those two sat that race out. 
It made it a weaker addition of the Rebel than we're used to seeing that Timberlake defeated in there. And it also gives a little bit more time now to those two horses who skipped the Rebel, and now they're fresh and, and training up to this race. So uh, I think both those horses out of the Southwest, Mystic Dan and Liberal Arts, are interesting in the Arkansas Derby, not only because they finished up so well. Liberal Arts was really rallying nicely. It doesn't look like it in the margins because the way Mystic Dan shot off at the end of the race, it looks like Liberal Arts kind of flattened out, but he didn't. He came with a nice, good, sustained run, and in the gallop out, galloped out exceptionally well. So I think both of those horses are moving towards a good effort in this particular spot. We'll see how it all shakes out in the Arkansas Derby. And, you know, a lot of these horses at Oakland have had a stop-and-go early part of the campaign because they missed so many training days in January. That's thrown the whole trail off at Oakland for the horses locally based. Think about this. The Smarty Jones winner came in from a fairgrounds base, catching freedom. Uh, in the Southwest, uh, we saw that victory by Mystic Dan, uh, he came in from fairgrounds. In the Rebel Stakes, we saw another fairgrounds horse come in and win that race uh, in uh, uh, Timberlake, right? All these horses who have won the early preps were ones who did not have their training disrupted. They were all training somewhere else and vanned in for the race. We get that again. And in fact, the horses who ran in the Southwest and had that time where they missed the Rebel, they went back to their training uh, uh, places. So uh, it was back to fairgrounds for Kenny McPeak's horse, Mystic Dan, who now returns. Missed no time at all. It's been much better weather in Oakland in the last month or two, by the way, but and fast track predicted for Saturday. And Liberal Arts went back to the third Thoroughbred Center in Lexington, Kentucky, where he normally trains uh, in between starts. So it's been horses off the van and in the receiving barn who have been winning these races uh, at Oakland in the spring. We'll see if that shows up again. That's good news for Booth, who didn't miss much time at all right. uh, in Southern California. Sure, this year. One thing I want to mention about Liberal, because I know you like him, um, mm -hmm. and I made a, a, a case about not knowing what Mystic Dan's going to do because his win was on an off track. But I have mentioned liberal arts because he really ran well when he won the street sense yeah floppy track race at Churchill, and then came and ran well uh, in the mud again so i don't know whether he's a mud freak or not right he may not right be. but i one th one thing that i have a little bit more confidence in him is he's by arrowgate he's mm -hmm. not by golden sense so arrogate mm -hmm. i could see them developing regardless mm -hmm. of surface and getting better and better and better and uh, as a son of arrogate i don't think we've seen anywhere near uh, what liberal arts is going to be down the road, whatever, however, down the road that is. Right. Is that a mayor who was a really good race mayor out here in California, California bred daughter of tribal rule, who was mostly a sprinter? But yeah, um, if, if you if you get arrogate, if you got an arrogate, I don't care who you're out of, you got a chance to to, to run on. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's whatever price he's going to be. Liberal arts to me is uh, absolutely a must use here underneath, if maybe even on top, but certainly underneath. Right. Actors and trifectas. Yeah, I think he's part of the gamble in this particular race, and that's going to use him as such uh, up and down the exotics. Speaking of exotics, the Gulfstream Park will have an exactathon on Florida Derby Day Saturday on that 414 race card. If you can hit exactas in six or more races, you'll share in $20,000 in extra cash. Those exactathon bonuses have been two, three dollars $300 almost every week going back into your account. So play the exactas, $2 exacta minimums to be in the exactathon and make sure that you register for the promotion. Uh, to play in those. We've got four stakes races to handicap now as we turn the page at Gulfstream Park to the Pan American Stakes. It'll be race number six on the card, our first of the stakes races to handicap in here. Jeff and I did not talk about our picks beforehand, but then once he sent me the format for the show, uh, we're in pretty good agreement here at Gulfstream Park on Saturday. So, Jeff, let's start off here in the Pan American. We're both on Cortez. To me, I've got pure 12 furlongs written in my past performances. This one looks set for the distance. Uh, uh, Christoph Clement, Joel Rosario teaming up here out of the two hole. He does so well with these Euro shippers and Curtez and English Brett Gelding. 19 starts, five wins. Overall, 14 out of 19 in the frame, as they say mm -hmm. over there. Plus, uh, he's training really well. This this Gelding, and sometimes you don't see this uh, from Euro shipping in, but this this Gelding looks like he's been here forever. He's he really is training well. He's the one that's uh, going to trail early stock the, the, uh, the, the, the workmate here. He's going to go to the outside, and uh, he really does move well. He switches leads right on cue, which is like like to see with these euros right there. Smooth mover. And uh, so I know he's fit and ready. Um, he's run well fresh in the past, um, obviously uh, in great hands. And uh, I expect him to run back to his better races in Europe, which – 
are good enough to beat this group. His time form ratings are consistently in the teens, which um, are good enough to beat this level of competition as he disappears behind the bushes and into the fog. <laughs> I assure him, I'm assuming that he's still going well, which he is. Uh, and I went back and watched some of his video, some of his video races. Uh, he, um, he's, he, he lays close up. He's not some deep clothing plotter. He can, he can, he's very handy. You put him wherever you want him. He switches off. He gives you a second move. He's in the two hole here going a mile and a half. He's going to have to end. He's going to save ground. I mean, he's two to one, and that's probably what he should be. I know there will be um, play players who like Tawny Port, who actually is a nine to five morning line favorite. Um, and, and I think he'll run his race. But I look at Tawny Port and I look at Cortez, and Cortez's race, I think his level of competition has been better than Tawny Port's. Mm -hmm. So I'm going with Cortez. There are several horses in here who are mile, mile and a 16th types. To me, I think you got to focus on the real 12 furlong stamina sorts in here. Cortez would fit that bill. Of course, Tawny Port has morphed into that. Uh, and those are, to me, the two best long distance horses in this race. Starting over, the best of the Mike Makers may be in here to go the 12 furlongs. Several Mike Maker trainees in here. You always have to respect the Maker runners going a mile and a half on the grass. He just seems to have them in these kind of spots and uh, uh, should be in there with a chance. But I'm with you. Cortez, we're going to go with the international influence uh, first time here stateside. Uh, let's go next at Gulfstream Park on Saturday to the Orchid Stakes. This is the Philly version of what we just saw in the Pan American. Phillies and mares on the turf here going the mile and a half. And it's Christoph Kamant, Joel Rosario, and another import in here named La Manhata. And I'm with you on this one as well, Jeff. Uh, let's just keep uh, rolling through the victories together here on this Gulfstream card. This is a... Um... Uh, a really uh, very consistent mare, five-year-old mare running against you know top-class horses. I went back and watched her last two races on video. The first one at Saint Clou, Saint Clou, left-handed track, kind of like Belmont Park. I've actually been there. Kind of a uh, long, wide, you know, long strut run in, left-handed, as I mentioned. And um, in that race, she she actually sat second throughout. I mean, she put herself on the race right from the start. Mm -hmm. um, she switched off nicely, kind of galloped around, uh, edged clear to uh, in the final stages, and won without being knocked about. It was a good win. Mm -hmm. Something that a race that was good enough to earn her a start in a Group One race at Longchamp over a mile and three quarters uh, the week before the arc. I believe it was week before the arc. Uh, mm -hmm. She was ranking the ones who was really catching some monsters in that race. Um, sea Silk Run won it from off the pass. This this mare was actually in front inside the furlong pole and again use a good stalking trip um to run well she she's got a good handy style of running um she's kind of a grinder doesn't have a great turn of foot but going a mile and a half from the rail with uh, rosario i i would be really surprised if she's not right in frame every step of the way i mean right mm -hmm. in, right first second third saving ground grinding away and again based on her time form ratings uh, more than good enough to win a race like this, it's a good race. A lot of middle distance horses in here, but La, uh, La Mahana uh, definitely on resume has faced better, and I expect her to come up uh, off the layoff and uh, and fire a, a winning shot. Our Cali Kim, one of the horses of the meet, will scratch out of the spot. She's been retired this week. So you're going to take our Cali Kim out of this spot uh, off just a really sharp meet that she's had uh, with La Proviante and the very one winner last time out. Uh, you mentioned uh, some middle distance horses in here, surprisingly, coming out of the Pegasus Philly and Mare Turf. Last time out at a mile and a 16th, beaten by Diddy in a good effort there. But you wonder how far she'll want to go. McKulik makes the first start since the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf last year for Chad Brown. Interesting. I thought you go back and you look how will she run off the layoff in her first start from 22 to 23 they brought her back in the modesty at a mile and eighth and she didn't fire hardly at all that day when expected to run much better at three to one so form cycle does she repeat that form cycle and need a race a mile and a half is not where you go if you need a race i wouldn't think so uh McCulloch to me is one to try to maybe take a stand against but chad brown and affiliate mayor turf race uh, certainly he's had a better second half of the meet at Gulfstream than he did the first half of the meet, but the barn hasn't been firing uh, in the division like we expect to see over the years in this Philly Ameriturf division. To Gulfstream we go now to the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Let's go to race number 11. It's the Express Bet race of the week. Uh, Gulfstream Park Oaks, a mile and a 16th. Of course, prep here towards the Kentucky Oaks, potentially. 
Uh, we've got a, a field of nine in this race, Jeff. We talked about Chad Brown's barn heating up a little bit more. The second half of the Gulf Stream meet uh, Ways and Means, one who will be starting for the first time since the spinaway stakes. What do you make of this filly in here by Practical Joe? I think she has a chance to be a, 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 among the leaders in the division this year as a three-year-old if she comes back to her two-year-old form. Mm -hmm. First time out at Saratoga, she won by almost 13 lengths. She didn't even get a good trip. She got knocked mm -hmm. sideways at the start. She was in a box. She made this move to, to get within range at the three-eighths pole. And one of these moves wide at Saratoga, you kind of expect them to kind of <laughs> loom a threat and flatten out. You've seen that a million times, haven't yeah. you? You know, but this time she loomed it and then kept on going. I mean, she just blew them away and earned a huge number. And, and it should have been even easier than that uh, based on the trip that she got. It was for this reason that she went off at two to five and the, and the spin away. And another brutal trip. She, she broke okay, was allowed to settle, um, got into a box, wasn't real happy, loomed the threat wide, and then looked like she'd spent a lot of energy to get where she needed to get to be a, uh, a factor. I uh, got to bright work, couldn't get by mm -hmm. and bright work was undefeated. Uh, at, at that time, time she was sharp. Yeah. She, was yeah. she had won four in a row, six clear of everybody else. And obviously came out of the race worse for wear. So they stopped on her, uh, which is fine. Why, why not? She's come back at Payson park and worked and, She's worked like, oh my God, this filly is a monster. Look at her on, look at her on the outside. Now, tell me if she went in forty-eight two. Could she have gone in forty-six if they let her run here? Look at the, yeah. the stranglehold the jocks got on her. She's trying to stay even with the workmate, um, mm -hmm. but no, 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 no. You don't want to go too fast. We don't need this. We know you can run. You don't have to prove anything to us, you know. And, yeah. and she's still lengthening out. This tells me not only does tell me that she's coming back at least as good, if not better, than she left. But I don't think Chad would be rushing her back in this race um, if he didn't think she was ready. I mean, he doesn't have to. He got the whole year. What's the rush, right? But uh, right. I think he's probably gotten to a point here where I got a runner and can she run long? I yeah, I think she can run long. Can she run well we, fresh? No, you can, she can do that. Why not run her? And that's why she's in here. We've seen enough Chad Brown works over the years to know that was a secretary at Belmont stakes like margin of victory for a Chad Brown workout, like right. a long neck. I mean, right. they all finish right up together. Like you said, you know, they, you know, like I, I can put this horse away at any point in time, but that's not the MO of the barn. You know, it's to finish up on even terms. And uh, like I said, she pulled off by a long neck, maybe a, a quarter to half length in that. And that's, that's a big margin in a brown work. That means you can't hold them anymore because they don't wire yeah. like mirrors. Right. I mean, she galloped out to the three quarter pole. It was a half mile work. It might as well have been a six furlong. So that's what they do back there. Pletcher does the same thing where they, they work them, work them a short distance, but they have a long run up to the pole and then let them breeze on out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just, you know, California guys, if they're working on three quarters and 12, you're working three quarters. I mean, you're going to mm -hmm. work hard, you know, but not back there. Their three-quarter works are really put down on the paper as half. Uh, but anyway, she looks great. And uh, I, I really think um, she's got a chance, based on what we saw last year in New York at Saratoga, to be uh, a, a really a top performer in her division. She's just starting back. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I'm expecting her to come back uh, and, and, and be outstanding. Devona Dale winner Fiona's Magic comes back here in the Gulfstream Park Oaks, but she stretches out to two turns. This might be a little bit far for her, uh, but we'll see. She went wire to wire in the Devona Dale holding on there. I thought power squeeze at two turns with that inside post position, really advantageous. The one hole is great, a mile to 16th at Gulfstream Park. Short run into the clubhouse turn, so she saves ground there. They only have the uh, first wire to worry about, so save ground, get around there. Power squeeze has run around two turns twice, won both of them, so I think that uh, she might be the value in here when you've got Pletcher with Scalable. you got Chad's horse, Ways and Means, who's going to get bet a lot. I think Jorge Delgado who wins at a really high percentage, especially when team with Daniel Centeno over from Tampa. I think Power Squeeze is going to be an interesting price in here. She's maybe not fast enough on numbers with some of these, uh, but I'll tell you what, I like her going around two turns while some of the others have to answer the two-turn question, including Ways and Means. But the way she worked and the way she showed her quality last year, Jeff, she's absolutely the filler to beat. I'm probably getting too cute by giving Power Squeeze the shot in here, uh, but that would be the gamble there. I, I feel like your old partner, Aaron Veracruzzi, there, where I'm taking a price horse in here in the teeth of something that looks awfully good, but, uh, uh, you know, 
I, I think this one's got a shot in here. I like the two for two around two turns. So power squeeze for me in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. But if I'm playing a multi-race wager, I'm playing the Exactathon. I'm certainly using ways and means in there on top. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to get knocked out by ways and means. The thing about power squeeze is on form, she looks pretty good. On numbers, she's slow. Right. But that's why you're going to get a price. I yeah. mean, you know, if yeah. she was fast on figures, you know, it should be five to two or whatever. Now you're going to get more mm-hmm. than that. And and sometimes these fillies, they they come, they, they step forward. Horses don't remain stagnant. They don't remain the same. They get better or they mm-hmm. get worse. But the gamble is that they're going to continue to get better. And if you do that, then you get rewarded if you're right. Change gears now towards the Florida Derby, the Florida Derby, the main event that has last year's two-year-old champion and breeders got as the headline. Around the far turn they go. Fierceness grabs the lead. Muth right up alongside. General Partner gives way and is back into third. And they're into the stretch. And it's Fierceness and Muth. The two of them turning for home with Fierceness in front. Fierceness is opened up here to a two-length lead. Muth is second, then Timberlake down the outside, but it is going to be Fierceness and John Velasquez. Oh, they're running away. Fierceness, a powerhouse win. Can he get back to that form? He didn't have it in the Holy Bull when flat through the stretch. Mild trouble at the start, but I think people overblew the impact of that on the race because the horse he had mild trouble with the start was Domestic Product, who outran him for second in that same race, the Holy Bull. And of course, Domestic Product sent him back to win the Tampa Bay Derby. So it's fiercest. The eight to five morning line favorite, Brian Natto, the track morning uh, line maker. Natto made this horse the favorite, and I think will be favored over Hades back again. I don't think the public's going to buy completely into the upset last time from Hades in a one-shot deal on the return. I think Fierceness will be fairly solidly favored again, Jeff. What do you say? Well, it was that was such a weird race because it went 25 flat, 50 and 2, 114 and 1, and that's a false pace. And sometimes horses, when you s- slow them down so much, Sometimes they love it and they kick on, and sometimes they get mad and they say, forget it, you know, I'm not running today. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what to make of fairness, but I can tell you this. You know, you know, we we know how impressive he was in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. So we know that if he runs back to that race, he's got a very good chance of likely being the winner. How has he trained since then? Well, you know, mm-hmm. suddenly he's training really well. He was training yeah. like that last race was a fluke. Here he is um, on the um, inside of Tuscan Sky. Sky. And here he's, you know, this is a pristine trip. You know, he's on the rail in front, nobody around him. So he's going to work well because that's the way he runs well. Mm-hmm. But you can see how easily he's doing it. And, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're Pletcher and you have him work like this, you, you, you say to yourself, how in the world does this horse not run well? It's not like I'm guessing that he can't run. We've seen what he can do, not once, but twice. Don't forget about his maiden win by 11 lengths in the 109 and 2 at Saratoga in the mud. So, I mean, it's not like he hasn't shown he can be brilliant on his best day. And he certainly was in this work. He's absolutely toying with a decent sort of Colt and Tyson's Tuscan Sky. And he's galloping out. Well, this is why I talk about the gallop out where they give him five eights in the 101, but He's really working seven eights here. So, I mean, he's fit. And the other thing is the way this race projects, Jeremy, is that Hades is going to go and Fiercest is going to dra- fold over, assuming he gets out mm-hmm. of the game mainly, and sit second or third. Same kind of trip he got in the Breeders' Cup. So um, right. he projects to have absolutely no excuses here. And I think even if he goes out and does what I think he's going to do, and that is win this race and win it stylishly, it's still not going to tell me whether he can take dirt. Because I don't think he's going to get any dirt here. And that's why right. I think he's going to win. Yeah, being outside can be advantageous in that respect because he's not going to get any dirt. Even if he's sitting second or third, he's going to be uh, out in the clear and avoid a lot of that kickback. Uh, what about uh, Conquest Warrior in here? He's the X Factor, the horse coming off of a maiden win and an allowance win for Shug McGahee. I really like the way he did it last time. He's proven over the nine furlongs. Now he's got to be proven for class on the step up. He beat allowance horses going over this trip in 150 and two. Uh, some years that's fast enough to win a Florida Derby in 150 and two. Uh, if fierceness runs his race, we expect to see this race probably, uh, you know, 149 and change. Uh, if he runs one of his good races in here, uh, what do you make of Conquest Warrior and his chances under Jose Ortiz? Well, I put his last race under the microscope. I watched it several times and focused on Conquest Warrior. 
And the one thing that I will that came I came away with was I don't really know how good Conquest Warrior is, but he utilized about 20% of his energy in that race. <laughs> he never even had to take a deep breath. He was goofing off. They didn't ask him to do anything other than win the race. He, he was up by, up by five. The race was over at the top of the stretch. If he had had another horse to come get, I'm sure he would have been asked to do that. And mm -hmm. I think he probably would have gotten it, but there was no need for that. So anybody who is trying to critique Conquest Warrior based on who he beat, how fast he ran, what his buyer number is, I think is misrepresenting what Conquest Warrior is capable of right. doing. He had all kinds of trouble two races back when he beat a decent sort of horse in an Aquarian, and he still, that race he had to, to lay his body down, and he did. So I think he was just looking for a challenge that never existed. I certainly think he's going to have challenges here, but he's going to have one or two horses at least that he's going to have to come get. Hades, who will have no option but to go. Uh, I do think Fierceness will stay close to him. These horses will, should ensure a, a decent uh, pace. They're going to hook up, and then Conquest Glory is going to see them see them in the sights, you know, and they can say, okay, I got to go get those two horses. And then we'll find out how good he is. I am really expecting Conquest Warrior to run a, a major, major race. Whether or not he's good enough to beat fierceness, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah. that's what he has to prove. But if I'm playing this race, the only two horses I'm concerned with are fierceness and Conquest Warrior. I don't see any way Hades wins this race unless fierceness makes a right-hand turn into the clubhouse turn and is not part of the pace. Because Hades got away with a walking pace he won nicely. He did what he had to do. But this is a whole different level of uh, of challenge that he's facing. And this race historically has some crazy 40, 50, 80 to one shot run somewhere second or third in it. A locally based horse with a locally based trainer. Uh, so we know it looks like three horses on paper. And it really feels like three horses on paper. But if one of the three doesn't fire and hit the board, you're looking for some chaos in there. Be shopping around for one of those big price locals maybe uh, to round out your trifectas. Or maybe even split them up in an exacta and kind of throw a monkey wrench into things uh, in terms of the returns but fierceness or conquest warrior the two most likely winners of this race jeff and i both agree on that uh hades expected to run his race again but i don't think trip's going to be quite as easy as it was last time uh when he won in the uh, of course the fountain of youth winner door knock not in the lineup because he's headed to keeneland next week to run in the bluegrass so we'll get a sense of maybe how those Florida runners shake out nationally. This is a very insular group that's running on Saturday. Not a lot of barometers from out of town or anything like that to get a feel for how good the Floridians are right now. We do know domestic product came out of his race at Gulfstream and won the Tampa Bay Derby. But again, those were mostly Floridians there as well in Tampa. So door not coming north to run in the uh, bluegrass at Keeneland will be the first sense we get this spring of just how good the crop was down in Florida this year. Again, I want to remind you, Exactathon coming up on Saturday. Take your shot on playing the exactas in each of the 14 races. If you can click on six races hitting the exacta, $2 minimum bets now for the exactathon. Don't forget that. You'll share in $20,000 in cash just by hitting six exactas on the card. And of course, if you have the most exactas of any of the players at First Better Express Bet who opt into the promotion, you'll share your uh you'll get your share of $5,000 in additional cash. Be sure to play the exactathon this weekend. That's going to wrap up our handicapping for this first call podcast for Saturday. Again, early start time, Dubai World Cup, 7.30 a.m., the first post time. The Arabians kick things off in the opener, then eight thoroughbred races, culminating with the Dubai World Cup. Uh, that goes right around the start of the Gulfstream program. Gulfstream with the early start on Saturday, so there'll be some overlap between Dubai and the beginning of Florida Derby Day, as we traditionally see. One of the real fun, long days on the calendar, Jeff, but it should be a great day of racing on Saturday. Remind fans... Uh, on Sunday for Easter Sunday at Gulfstream Park, there will be a mandatory payout in the Rainbow Six. Estimated pool could be seven and a half million dollars, according to track officials. Uh, based current carryover, I think is around seven hundred thousand. Uh, they're going to put a lot of money into it Friday and Saturday. If nobody hits the Rainbow Six, they estimate seven and a half million in the pot for Sunday. No racing in New York on Sunday for Easter. No racing at Santa Anita. There is going to be a lot of interest on Easter Sunday in that mandatory pick six at Gulfstream. Looking forward to a great weekend of racing. I'll be home. No, no Santa Anita to go to. Uh, I'll be watching everything. You know, if there's basketball, there's racing around the country that is critical to the Derby picture. Get up early and watch the races in Dubai. So uh, it is going to be a 
a busy and fun day. And I, I like I say, I, I'll have the full card analysis at, for Gulfstream Park. A number of races I, I find uh, playable and, and offering good value. So I'll be diving in there. So check out uh, the full card analysis and express betting on my blogs at sananita.com um, and xptv.com and uh, follow along. Let's leave you one for the road. It's Eddie Olchek's hat trick for Florida Derby Day on Saturday. Hey, everybody. Florida Derby Day. What a day it will be at Gulfstream Park. Best of luck to everybody, and it's time for my hat trick. Let's start off in race nine, number five, Shaq Diesel. Turns back in distance, drops in class off the last effort. Lots of speed in here, I believe, to follow, and it sets up for a one-run type. Give me the Shaq. Race nine, number five, Shaq Diesel. Let's go to race 13. I'm going to go at Ice Chocolate. Finally gets an inside post position. The last four races, just absolutely awful draws, but the horse has still been running well. Drops in class. I think all systems go here. Second pick of the day is in race 13, Ice Chalk a lot. And the big race of the day, race number 14, the Florida Derby. I'm going to go with number nine, Conquest Warrior. Visually impressive in the last. I know it's a huge step up from an allowance race, but if the legendary Hall of Fame then I'm going to get to uh, be able to play this horse right on the nose. That's good enough for me. The value should be there. Probably going to end up being the second choice, but I will take my chance with number nine, Conquest Warrior, to finish my hat trick in race 14, the Florida Derby. Have a great day, everybody.